in the North Atlantic Ocean, near the northwest coast of Africa. There, there lies the autonomous region of Madeira, where 20 Bitcoiners are trying to achieve the unthinkable. Madeira is going to be competing with the likes of countries that adopted it already, like El Salvador. In this video, I will show you how we gathered people from all over the world to embark on a secret mission to try to convince the president of Madeira to embrace Bitcoin on the island. If this goes right, magic can happen. I love this guy. <laughs> Everything started with this Bitcoiner. His name is Andrew and he's from Madeira. Strange feeling to be. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Bitcoin. Good morning. And he had a pretty crazy idea. What would happen if he tries to convince the president of Madeira to embrace Bitcoin? And then there was a chain of events, crazy chain of events that led to that. He was reaching out to a couple of Bitcoiners from all over the world and all of them came to Madeira to help him to make this happen. So the goal is to convince the president to embrace Bitcoin. And that's why we are all here. We started off uh, by introducing everyone around the table. And that's why I can say I'm very impressed by the brain power at the table. A, a fantastic group of people here, um, effectively trying to integrate Bitcoin into the economy uh, here and finding the best path to de-risk it for the government to be able to bring Bitcoin adoption here and build the future of Madeira on a monetary standard that's sound and, and attract global talent to Madeira. So really exciting first steps. We just discussed how would, do we want to frame Bitcoin, how do we want to frame the Bitcoin mining, just to make a general overview about the strategy. And yeah, we're setting all this up now uh, at the speed of light to help the government pursue the Bitcoin strategy for Madeira. Okay, you might recognize a few faces from that, uh, that video there. Um, we were all there, part of that uh, conversation and part of that uh, three or four days that we spent over there. Thank you to Andre because he is a native Madeiran. So do you want to give a quick uh, introduction as to who you are and why you think, um, why did you try and orange pill the president of your country? Well, that's... I'm a Bitcoiner, so that, <laughs> that's what we do, right? <laughs> but, um, well, my name is Andre, I'm a Madeiran, uh, father of four, entrepreneur. And um, it was, it was uh, I saw Portugal going on a, on a bad way and Madeira going on a bad way as well, uh, because the, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the whole of Portugal is tax-free on crypto. And on my view, uh, it wasn't uh, actually, it wasn't good for the country because it, we, we were flooded with a lot of alt projects. <laughs> and um, I wasn't seeing Madeira also going in a good direction. So when the opportunity arose to, you know, to try and influence somehow and, and, and guide the government on this new path that I believe it's the, the righteous one, I took it. And uh, I was fortunate to have uh, a network and Daniel was very <laughs> important at the time. And uh, we spread out the message and people helped, people reached out and, and uh, uh, it was possible to bring the president to Miami where he understood the, the importance of this and um, how it fitted in his overall strategy for Madeira. Because the president realizes that for the first time in history, Madeira, as a, a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, finally uh, actually has a competitive advantage on a global landscape. 
uh, because our digital world is right now and a, a lot of people can work from anywhere and all uh, jurisdictions kind of have basically uh, the same capabilities of attracting people and Madara has some serious points on that because it's overall a place with very good quality of life and, um, and very good infrastructures, not only physical but technological. And the president um, has a strategy of attracting businesses and individuals to the island to be not so much reliant on the tourism uh, as we were before. Um, and he sees this new technology as a part of that overall um, you know, I don't know, uh, objective strategy. strategy. Yes. Yep. So uh, Knut here is uh, an author. You've probably seen him uh, selling his books out there. He's written three books uh, about uh, Bitcoin, and he's also termed himself an armchair philosopher. <laughs> well, you're in an armchair, pal. Yes, <laughs> so I am. philosophize. What, All right. What did you, what, what did you think um, when you were there as part of this group? What did you feel? Oh, uh, first of all. Do we know an, uh, a synonym for uh, alt projects? Do, does anyone know a better word? <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> That's I was it. Trying to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, w when the opportunity arose, uh, I, uh, it was a no-brainer. I've, I've been on Madeira sever several times before, and uh, I uh, met Andre online first, and then we met in Miami on also. A, on, on a dating app. Well, on a dating no, app, no, no, yes. No, no. <laughs> 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 Wife swapping. No, no. <laughs> but, but then, um, yeah, we, we hung out in Miami and I came to uh, Madeira a month before this fantastic group assembled for the first time. And uh, to me, it was a no-brainer because I, I view uh, what we're living through now as the first stages of hyper Bitcoinization, if we're familiar with that concept. And the way I see it, the Europe and Europeans have two ways. They have, it's a binary thing right now. Uh, we can either choose Chinese style dystopian uh, constant boot to the face thing, which most people th seem to prefer, <laughs> or we can, or we can choose Bitcoin and, um, uh, by uh, working with the president of Madeira and uh, with the government there, we believe that we can make the transition to, Bic to a Bitcoinized world smoother rather than just being a car crash, which is what hap what's happening everywhere else. At this point, I want to bring in, hopefully, if we have the technology correct, we'd like to bring in some other members of that team who are going to uh, join us remotely, and that's Jeff Booth, Larry Lapard and Greg Foss. There they are. There they are. Oh, we see them down here. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> so if you're not aware of who these guys are, uh, a quick introduction. Jeff is an uh, author, an entrepreneur. He wrote the book, The Price of Tomorrow. Greg and Larry are very well known in the space, investors in the space as well. So they were part of this trip with us and met the president and the other governing bodies. So I'd just like to get your guys' take on what you felt whilst we were there during the trip and the kind of meetings that we had. Um, I think Andre just said, uh, said it perfectly. Uh, the president is aware uh, and, and very aware that Bitcoin is becoming the new, new peer-to-peer <laughs> internet. It's the base layer for everything. Um, and although that's early, he realizes that an island nation can now attra attract talent and compete with something like Silicon Valley. And, and it's only going to accelerate from here. And he wants to give his citizens the benefit of that value. Um, and when I look at that, I look at it as it, it's almost an experiment like Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador. It's a small region that there's 170 million Bitcoiners around the world that are going to race to see what's going on and bring in tourism, then businesses. I've already set up a business in Madeira myself, and I'm looking to do more in, uh, in Madeira because of the awareness that the president has and, and, and bringing essentially free, free market capitalism and free market to, to Madeira and what's going to happen emerge because of that. So really, exci really excited about the, this project. 
I think the uh, to add on to what Jeff said, the uh, there's a already a template, and that template is El Salvador, uh, where you have real life uh, metrics that are proving the advantages. So El Salvador is a small country of six million people, larger than Madeira, obviously, but the numbers should line up similarly on a percentage basis. The top line GDP of uh, El Salvador on a $28 billion economy grew 10%. That's $2.8 billion for the good guys. It was predominantly tourism, as Jeff mentioned, but don't overlook things like remittances and uh, elimination of credit card fees and fee-seeking fiat uh, tradfi companies. So very bullish on the potential, not just for uh, El Salvador and uh, uh, Madeira, obviously, but just for the concept to take root uh, around the world. As a credit guy, um, you always look at the metrics. You look at the quality of management in a company or a country. And in this case, the quality of management in Madeira, that being the president, is a forward-looking, smart manager of an economy that's going to improve the lives of the citizens of Madeira. I couldn't say much better than these guys. They've really covered it. I mean, the tourism has gone up so much in El Salvador as a result of their adoption, which is a huge thing. And I think they want to capture that. And the government officials that we met in Madeira were very, very intelligent. They really got it completely. And uh, that was probably the most positive part of the experience was realizing that they understand what we're talking about and they're going to move uh, with all due speed to uh, to support Bitcoin on their island. And, and that was impressive. And I think that's just so I want to build on that. Tourism is only the first domino to fall. Then people go there and they say, wow, look at the infrastructure here. Look at the support. I could see myself living here. And the next domino falls. Now they, they say, how do I create a business here? And the next domino falls. That's how, the, that's how this works and how it spreads across the world. So Andre, do you want to talk about the, uh, the Free Madeira organization that was uh, backed by the president and the, uh, the kind of uh, remit that you were given by him personally? Yeah, so the, we uh, agreed on, on doing this as a, a non-profit outside of the government with their support, uh, but we were basically you know, going to work it out as a, as a, as a, you know, a grounds up initiative. And uh, the whole idea is to, uh, on a, a very high level to, you know, ad not adopt, I don't like to say adoption because of the, the people confused with the illegal tender, that's not the case, but adoption of, on the real economy of merchants, of the people spreading education, um, Greg mentioned the remittances case. I don't know if you're aware, but Madeira is a very immigrant island. We have a big diaspora all over the world, especially a very large community in Venezuela that is still not using the network for remittances. And we, we want to help them understand the technology to, to save them money and, and, and speed and everything that we know that's bad with the current system. Um, uh, so we have a, we have all other all other goals in the organization, but I would say those are the most important ones. Yeah. Anything to add there, Knut? Yeah, just the the website freemadeira.com. There you can read about the project and uh, see what the other goals are. And the uh, one of the goals is to make the organization self sustainable. And I know both you and I are planning to at least semi move to Madeira to begin <laughs> with, but we both hope that we'll end up there someday, I think, uh, to see this beautiful plan uh, play out. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the most important things as well with the, with the education, the, the spreading of the knowledge is, and I think I'm sure that Jeff will expand on that much better and eloquently than me, as uh, you know, the, Europe is cracking. And um, we're trying to set up the base and the people and prepare them for a, in a par parallel structure as it was um, uh, spoken a lot of times here at the conference, uh, basically to prepare them the most that we can for what's coming next. Uh, that's really important. 
At this point, I want to see if there are any questions out there. I want to bring questions straight in because, yep, there's two, three. <laughs> okay, that's, that was a good decision. <laughs> Yeah, I had that idea already when the man from this uh, shop said something. Did anybody of you think about when that hybrid, okay, maybe not hyperinflation, but maybe there will a hyperinflation come? What will happen if just normal people like me, like like I'm an IT guy, you know, I, I just work and pay and and, and put bills to my. Uh, uh, customers, yes. And what if us IT people will demand, no, we don't want to be paid in euros anymore because they don't have a value. Did anybody of you consider that? What, 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 what flood that will bring? I mean, IT guys know about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And even if, if they may not have them so far, but that will be a, a big push, not, not buying, not selling, but being paid just for work. Yeah, exactly. So that's what uh, can I, Andre Can I jump in on that one? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Je Jeff's actually an IT entrepreneur, so he's probably the yeah. best guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually what happened. You have, an open, you have an open network, an open protocol that is building on a network effect, actually two network effects. One on a base protocol that can't be changed uh, and, and decentralized and secure. And then lightning on top of that and, and, and liquid and a whole bunch of other second layer uh, protocols, FETI, that are emerging that are making this a global currency. And as that happens, as every single node, as every single person is, is, is making that decision, they're accruing more, remember the value of a network effect, you're in IT, the value of a network effect is defined by every additional person in the network creates more value for all users. So you have two really powerful network effects feeding back on themselves, which is why the president understands that this is the future of everything. Everything is going to be built on top of this. And it's just a foregone conclusion that what you just said, more and more people are going to do. And as they un as they, as the existing system gets worse and worse, more it's going to drive more and more people to the free market to be able to see that. Because what's what's actually happening in, in Bitcoin is it's not Bitcoin is when you think Bitcoin is rising, you're actually defaulting to a fiat currency mindset. What's actually happening in Bitcoin is everything is falling against Bitcoin forever. Every, every price is falling against Bitcoin forever. And it's the fiat mindset that's being debased that is causing the confusion. But every single person in the world just has a choice to move over to the growing network effect, which creates more value for all users. So can I add on that, uh, Princey? Basically, one of Jeff's great lines is uh, we're going to see 100 years of change in the next 10 years. So a hundred uh, centuries worth of change. If we look back one century, we'll probably see that in the next uh, 10 years. And this, this Zoom call is just riveting for me because three years ago, this Zoom call wasn't, po uh, wasn't uh, even uh, possible, right? And, or perhaps it was, but I certainly didn't know about it. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, the rapid change in uh, in technology is an adoption. If you compare the adoption of Bitcoin to the ado adoption of cell phone technology, it's exceeding it. If you compare the adoption of Bitcoin to Internet, it's right in line with it. And what that means is it could be viewed as a network adoption rate and valuation and i don't want to bring too much economics or you know forecasts in here but fidelity's valuation model of bitcoin based on an adoption technology is for bitcoin to achieve a price of over 1 million us dollar per bitcoin by the year 2030. Um, my personal opinion is that is low but it's got to go through their price target before it gets to my price target. But avoiding all that, come back to the adoption and just think of people now who assume you can link uh, Edinburgh, Scotland with two Canadians and a guy from Boston uh, to a conference in Prague with two Swedes, a Madeiran, and Princey, I don't know where you live, brother, but somewhere <laughs> in Europe, uh, you know, you got you to gotta lo you gotta lock yourself into a spot at some point. But this is technology that really... Uh, is changing the world. So don't overthink things. Yes, it is a revolution. It is the most important technological and financial uh, development in my career. And I'm 60 years old, so I've seen a lot of stuff. I also grew up with a rotary dial phone. 
Uh, this stuff <laughs> blows me away. Don't overthink it. It is coming. Yes, get paid in Bitcoin. It is the future. Yeah, we, we got video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's that's one of the important parts of the project on Madeira. That's what's going to be happening at grassroots level when Bitcoiners go and they um, they plug in to the Free Madeira project. One of the educational pieces will be to send people out with the, with the knowledge who have the knowledge to go and help the merchants understand how to interact with the Bitcoin network, how to accept payment, perhaps even gift point of sale machines or bulk cards. We have very, very strong relationships within the whole network of the companies that can help us do this. And there's two companies out here. Uh, Lando was up here already, Consensus Network are here. They accept Bitcoin. They, accept, they, they give a discount for their products and services to be paid in Bitcoin because that's how they, f you know, th that's their future. They see that if they're accepting Bitcoin, this is the quickest way for them to accept. So hands up again, who has the mic? Did someone get the mic uh, just here? One here and then. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I know we're talking about finance, but more um, uh, something more related to freedom in general for Madeira. How independent is Madeira today from the mainland influence? Because I just learned it, it has its own president. I didn't know that. I thought it was all one part with, uh, with Portugal. Uh, is there a lot of EU influence, a lot of WEF -E influence? Uh, what, what was the corona crisis like? Did they implement QR codes, uh, stuff like that? What's the, the, the spirit there? Well, Madeira is considered the uh, outermost region of, Madeira, of um, Europe, and it's a semi-autonomous region of Portugal, uh, along with the Zorish. So the two archipelagos have their own government and their own parliament. And they have some freedoms, but not all of them. So there's... Um, let's say a Magna Carta of stuff that they can influence and, and create their own laws or adapt the national laws and some differences, for example, regarding taxes. Uh, they cannot say that they cannot change the tax law, but they can apply differences, for example, on certain things. Um, but yeah, we are under the umbrella of the Portuguese government and the EU. Uh, I don't know about the WEF. The WEF I think we, everybody's under the umbrella of the web. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe except not El Salvador not right now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. That's geopolitics. But um, yeah, so we are not independent for sure. But we have more freedom than other parts of Portugal. Andre, can I build on that? And I think because it's a very important question. The question is, is it effectively comes down to can I trust if I go to Madeira that things won't change um, into this centralization and what Knut was saying, a Chinese type of style, socialism everywhere, that control style. Can I, can Madeira be independent from that? And the truth is right now, the truth is right now, the Madeiran president knows that and he knows where this is going and he's developing an economy to be self-sovereign so that that it doesn't happen. And as that's happening, so he's essentially riding two horses. And at some point, he's going to have to choose a horse. Um, but at the same time, he's riding two horses and, choose, and, and re realizing that, okay, I have to do this for the economy of this. The other horse is breaking down all over the world. And so, the, and, and, and more and more regions are going to come on and make the, exist, the existing infrastructure, that centralization. And, and the centralization comes as, because it's all about money, the centralization must include coercion and a removal of individual rights and freedoms. And nations are going to start to see that and they're going to have a choice, which place do I want? And there is no, like Knut said, there is no middle ground. It's going to be one or the other. And, and the president knows that he's moving to a place that he can make that decision because he's going to have a robust economy before that happens. Yeah, the, the horse we're riding is, is from Troy, if you know that place. <laughs> 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 and just the, the second part of the question you asked about COVID measures, if I, if I remember, did you just oh. want to give you? Yeah. yeah, so they did implement the same measures as in the mainland. Um, it was actually, 
I think it, it was actually one of the first regions to block the airport, for example, from tourism, because you know people were scared that at the time, very scared. But it was also one of the first ones to open it again. But, well, no, also because of economy reasons that we are very dependent on tourism. So I guess it was it was a big uh, reasoning to open the uh, the airport again. But um, there was there was. I'm, I think there was more social pressure from the people that were scared at the time than the government itself. Um, because, f for example, I, I don't know if I can say this, but I never complied with anything. <laughs> and <laughs> I had no problems at all. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, <laughs> the young lady just here, please, with the microphone, who has the microphone? And of course, it's one of my daughters again that's asking <laughs> one of the questions. <laughs> um, so uh, my family and myself actually visited the island in April, and it's amazing to see what's going on. And I, it's so inspiring. And I can't wait to see what uh, the future holds. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask what the locals think about it, and um, if they're aware of what's going on, and how they reacted to it. Are they against it or for it? Well, it's a mixed feeling. Uh, there's a lot of people that are supportive of the idea. I've, I've been getting some really encouraging messages from locals. But there's also the, the guys who don't understand it. And, and yeah. that's why it's so important we start with the, with the education. Yeah. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, misunderstandings and, and, and ignorance overall uh, of, of the space. Um, and yeah, and as, as, as it's been said now, um, it's not that much time uh, to prepare the people for, for this transition that Jeff was mentioning. So uh, we need to move fast, we need to, to, to increase the awareness and the education of most well, people there. So. It might be worth mentioning that the, the population is quite old. The, yeah, the yeah. average age is quite high. Although yeah. it's been getting younger and younger, because for the last two years mm -hmm. there's been a lot of influx of people actually, yeah. mm -hmm. with the, with the, um, a very strong um, program for attracting nomads and remote workers, for example, lately, and that helped as well because these people are already users, and they it raised a lot of the awareness of of the thing in Madara as well. And when we were there, I'll, I'll bring in the panel here that are zooming in. Um, we. Whenever we went out for dinner, or uh, Greg's got a story about a surf shop, we were always asking the guys, do you accept Bitcoin? If they said no, do you accept tips in Bitcoin? And then that's a completely different story. <laughs> out comes the phone <laughs> immediately. And I, I remember having a beer with you and Christian when you got us lost in Nuns Valley. And we oh, were yeah. trying to kill some time. Yeah. Uh, I, we, I actually tipped the guy more than the cost of the beers. And that was, you know, it was six or seven euro. It didn't really matter. Uh, but it's about getting the phones out and walking them through the process of just downloading a very, very yeah. quick, basic um, Lightning wallet and just tipping them. Uh, and these guys, they, they all saw the same. I don't know if you guys want to share some of your stories. Yeah, we had the same experience. I mean, with, with several of the waiters, it, it was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> and as you all know, the Mun Wallet is the one I use. And it's a super easy wallet to install and get going. And we were uh, we were just doing lightning payments uh, right and left, and um, you know every every additional user is a node, right? And then they tell their friends, and they tell their friends, and and that's how this is going to happen, and it has to happen because it's such an obviously better system than the broken system we've got. Um, you know, we were at this conference in Scotland yesterday, and it's beautiful to see that the exact same thing is happening here in Edinburgh. Just tons and tons of people understanding it, spreading the word, etc., and. Uh, you can see it's it's a viral thing. It's going to spread throughout the world consistently. And you know the, the price of Bitcoin isn't really what matters. What matters is the number of users of Bitcoin. And as the number of you know, it's it's not number go up, it's user go up. That's the critical factor here. So and what we see everywhere you go, you see user go up. And as long as users go up and there's a fixed number of these things, uh, number is gonna go up eventually. So we're not too worried about that. It's a, it's a very positive situation. I have the uh, surf shop still on the back of my phone, Andre, uh, the decal. <laughs> now, this is important because <laughs> the name of the surf shop, this is incredible, was called Around Freedom. I'm not kidding. I'm not sure if you can zoom in. No, don't zoom in. You'll see my ugly face. But at the end of the day, 
look at this cool uh this is the surf shop still on the back of my phone from uh, madeira <laughs> so yeah it's adoption and it is happening in real time uh yesterday in edinburgh uh previously you know the uk was not adopting bitcoin but what's happened in their uk guilt market which is the bond market for the uk is absolute destruction which uh, is part of the fiat problem uh, where you lose confidence in the debt metrics and the debt system that will eventually cause pensioners uh, potentially their uh, their their savings and that is real time capital destruction that should cause great concern not just in the UK but around the world because what's happening in the UK is coming to a place near you I guarantee it because I've traded credit markets for 30 years and there's never just one cockroach, okay? This thing <laughs> is coming, this is real. Prepare yourself. It is an important diversifier of risk and you gotta do it for your children, pure and simple. But I'm actually just building quickly onto that. You also have to think with what's, hap with what's happening. Yeah. Jurisdictional arbitrage becomes critical. Because in the world before, in the world before, when all of your assets were in one one country, your housing was in it, you couldn't get out of that country, and that's how people locked you in, and, and you you run financial repression on citizens, uh, and they can't get out, and you could do anything you want, and the citizens can't uh, can't get out. Bitcoin, because you just remember twelve words, you can move anywhere, and what's happening is is. Places like Madeira, places like El Salvador, places, those are early leading indicators, but they're coming everywhere. It provides jurisdictional arbitrage to provide safety for your family, and you could go anywhere. And so these are these are really important places. A gentleman so, here with a question. Yeah. So speaking of centralization, um, my question is, you know, related to Bitcoin in general, and uh, with how susceptible it is to ASIC mining, as well as you know the cost of electricity what are your thoughts and I mean, how do you deal with the possibility of centralizing all the mining in a place like China or, you know, where one mining farm can have a, a large control over the network versus something that's less resistant For, to ASIC, like, uh, you know, random X type mining. The, the, this is a misconception about how Bitcoin works because miners don't create Bitcoin. Users do. Node runners do. As, as, as a node owner, you choose what, what software to run. So you just employ the miners to follow your rules. It's, it's like the rules of chess. It comes that analogy again. But like, if, if you know the rules of chess, you can play with other ch every other chess player in the world. If you choose to play without queens, you can play with a couple of chess players around the world, but, um, but, but not as many. <laughs> so, so, so we, the users, we are, we are the ones that are uh, decide what what the miners can and cannot do. So, if, uh, so centralization in mining is not a problem as long as, uh, as long as we all agree. It's just an agreement on a fixed set of rules. That's that's all Bitcoin is. So, uh, Wait, can, I, so can I can I just jump into that? And but because there are so many of these things that if you haven't understood Bitcoin, if you don't haven't gone down to the sand in Bitcoin, are really are really hard to understand. It takes time, and it takes time for you. But what I can guarantee, because I've done that work, and what Knut's saying is, is when we give you a snippet of information, it's hard to comprehend that as well. So, but Bitcoin is decentralized and secure, and will be forever because of a whole bunch of things that are built into the network and the open source. And you can prove anything I just said. You can just, you can, you can try, try to take away. I wrote an article called Finding, fi uh, Finding Signal in a Noisy World. I would encourage you to start there and just read why, deeply why, what Knut said is true. And then, and then try to poke a hole in that. And, but, and what you'll see is, and, and if we have something that's decentralized and secure at a base level forever, then what, it changes how society is built forever. And it's a really big, profound change that most people that are really deep in Bitcoin understand. And those that are not in Bitcoin are listening to noise through an existing system. Yeah, the, the article is available from the website, by the way. Uh, I think there were some more questions. Yep, at the back there. Uh, Pontus. Could we get a microphone? Uh, yeah, I want Nico. Thanks. Uh, yes, my question uh, was about 
uh, the liability of Madeira being part of uh, Portugal and the EU, which has already been addressed. But uh, is uh, secession something that is politically possible <laughs> in the future? And uh, how dependent is Madeira on trade with Portugal and the EU versus the rest of the world outside the EU? And what kind of resources are available on the island and, and how self-sustainable can they be? Well, this is a hard, hard question. I don't know about the trading percentages to the EU and outside, but I can imagine that it's mostly with, within Portugal and, and, uh, and the EU for the most part. Um, what can I say? Uh, secession. Andre, I don't let, me, let, let me take, let me take <laughs> that. Um, global trade requires trust. When you have manipulation and money, you have more and more mistrust. And why, why all over the world global trade is breaking down is because nobody trusts the money. So you can expect global trade to break down everywhere and then rebuild anew against a trust system. And the people that are moving to that trust system are going to be very wealthy because they're going to have more of that and they're going to be able to trade with others. Like I said, there's already 170 million Bitcoiners that can trust globally and trade with each other without friction on a lightning network. Um, and, and that's expanding every day. So it's going to, so, but the exist, remember global trade, the trade, talent, labor, everything requires trust in a currency. And we all know, and also do governments, that there's no trust in currency. So you can expect global trade to break down. The second part of the question is, uh, it says, can Madeira be self-sufficient? We believe so. They're not totally yet. But, but what ends up happening with what's, what's happening with their building is they're rebuilding an entire infrastructure on top of a trusted protocol. That's exactly what's happening. And, and, and so we believe it can be self-sufficient. And take that to one step further. And uh, Knut and I talked about this in Bulgaria. Global trade is a net uh, zero uh, equation, right? So for every country that's a net exporter, uh, you will have it netting against a net importer globally. So there's basically, as Knut will probably be able to take you through this if you want to, the manufacturing hubs of Brazil, uh, China, and Germany are net exporters. That being said, your European Union, which is based on the manufacturing strength of Germany, it is now flat. Germany is no longer a net exporter because of things like increased oil prices and whatnot. Its trade balance is flat. That is going to have enormous implications for the European Union, where Germany is essentially the sugar daddy of the European Union. So I think it's wise to set up a parallel network that will rely on something outside of the fiat system uh, of measuring exports and imports on a global basis, there will be winners. There will probably be winners at smaller scale like El Salvador and uh, hopefully Madeira. And then eventually it'll move up to the bigger G7 countries. Um, our home country of Canada, Better we better get our act in gear in Canada or I suggest Canadians start learning Spanish, okay? <laughs> this is important Portuguese. to understand. This is about <laughs> planning for the future um, and I, I can't say it in our, any other way. Stop looking in the rear view mirror. Let's measure things looking forward out through the windshield. I ju I'd just like to add a note of optimism because there's so, <laughs> there's so much FUD everywhere. Um, there's FUD about Bitcoin and how Bitcoin functions. And there's FUD about the WEF and there's FUD about the EU. But we got this, we got, you know, instant video conferencing to the other side of the planet, literally, by the touch of a button. We have social media and we have Bitcoin. We have all the tools we need to just not give a fuck about these bullshit institutions that never existed in reality in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so, just grab it. <laughs> There was another question just behind Pontus Nico. Nico is actually with us in Madeira and is part of the advisory board as well. If you visit freemadeira.org, you <laughs> yeah, you can see Nico smiling. Yeah. Dot com, by the way. Yeah, this, this is Dot not uh, much of a question because I already know the answer to it. Uh, but uh, I think you covered the money part pretty well already. 
but my question is why would somebody uproot their family and move to Madeira? I'm already based there with my family, so I, <clears throat> I have my own answers, but I was wondering maybe you can elaborate, especially Andre, maybe from the perspective of, uh, of a family man. And, Poncha, uh, maybe... right, Jeff? I think that's the answer. <laughs> Poncha. <laughs> and Poncha. also another yeah. thing, uh, <laughs> maybe for Dan, is like in, in terms of education and, and homeschooling, like what's the, how do you see the community and the, in, the, in the future? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a modern father of four. And as I said in the beginning, overall quality of life in Madeira is extraordinary. Um, if you get to visit all parts of the world, as I was fortunate to, to, to visit, uh, when you get back to Madeira, you realize that you are like, I don't know, top 5% quality of life in the world, for sure. Um, we are very fortunate. Uh, the weather is amazing all year round. It's called the Island of Eternal Spring. Uh, we have nature, we have, we have good food, everything grows in the island. Um, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I invite everyone to, to at least spend a few days there, go for a vacation, enjoy the sun, and I think you'll see it for yourself. And at night you can go for ponches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and for, for me and Nico, it's the island of eternal summer because we're from dark, cold north. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's very accessible as well with a, an excellent airport. Um, so the second part of your question was about um, education and homeschooling. Uh, the, the, I actually had a conversation with the president uh, about this because he was eavesdropping on a conversation I was having with uh, Prince Philip and uh, another Bitcoiner known, uh, uh, very well known in the space, Tour de Mista, uh, when we were in uh, Miami having a dinner. And, we were, and Tour himself is a big advocate of alternative parallel structures in the education system and redefining and, and starting something new. And the president asked, uh, what are you guys talking about and why are you talking about it? You know, we, th there are public schools for everybody, you know, free education is a human right, if anybody watched my chat yesterday. And I explained to him, some people, they don't want to send their kids, they want to take responsibility for education themselves. And he was like, okay, didn't know that was a thing. He li literally didn't know that was a thing. And he didn't know that there were rules in Portugal that um, a lot of people circumvent and you can homeschool there, but there is a little bit of jiggery pokery that you have to do. He didn't even know and he was not at all opposed to the idea of, of homeschooling. To him, it was a complete non-issue. So I don't think it's anything that he would ever try and stamp down and having you know so many Bitcoiners that want to come to the island and so many uh, people that, you know, if there was an official statement that said homeschooling is completely open, we're completely open to homeschoolers on the island of Madeira, that would bring in a whole different wave of people as well, which he wants. He wants not only the tourism, but he wants to bring in uh, more stable people that are going to come and build businesses and families there. Uh, so I, I hope that's answered your question. And there's another guy from the advisory board, him and his wife are already figuring out how to set up some kind of um, educational uh, initiative, forest school type thing. Um, it's, already, it's already starting. It's already started. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, we've got five minutes left, so let's get another question from the audience. There are a couple. Wherever you see the hands go up, sir, get, get there with the microphone. <laughs> yeah, in the last weeks or months, uh, I want to mention uh, two major news. Number one is that uh, BlackRock announced uh, to make investments in Bitcoin possible. I'm sure you're aware of that. On the other hand, there was a report from the White House that was uh, criticizing uh, Bitcoin from the uh, environmental perspective. So there's just two examples. Um, so do you see uh, any major headwinds or on the other side support from major uh, authorities or institutions in the near future? Of course. Um, <laughs> mainstream media is going to do what mainstream media is going to yeah. do. <laughs> and the, the FUD articles at the moment are being funded by um, other coins, let's say, uh, definitely coming from uh, <laughs> Ripple. <Yeah. laughs> uh, the, the founder of Ripple paid Greenpeace $5 million to write hit pieces about how bad Bitcoin is for the economy, uh, the environment, proof of work. Uh, so that's why we're seeing all of these um, kind of FUD articles appear into the, into the realms of mainstream media. I don't know if you guys have anything further to say there. 
And I just add, having spent my life at, 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 along with Larry, and he generously let, him, let me comment on this. The reason BlackRock is embracing Bitcoin after seven years of ignoring it, essentially, very simply, BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. Fidelity, who's been studying Bitcoin and mining Bitcoin since 2014 and promoting Bitcoin for the last three years, they're number five. And BlackRock is losing clients to Fidelity. So what happens if you want to remain competitive, you have to offer investment silos that your clients want. And the clients of Fidelity and the clients of BlackRock are in many cases the same institution that has just diversified their holdings amongst different custodians and asset managers. So again, don't overthink it. It's competitive. It's a competitive market out there. It will be like this with countries, and then it'll be like this with asset managers. And then finally, why do you read something out of the White House? Well, because the White House is paid for lobbyists from the banking system and the TradFi banking system that doesn't want Bitcoin to succeed because they will be disintermediated by the Bitcoin revolution. It's that simple. Follow the money, follow the results in terms of asset allocators, and then also follow the money like Greenpeace getting paid by the Ripple CEO, as Princey pointed out. Yeah, this is, what Greg just said is so important. Just re remember, everything you're looking through is based on a system that requires centralization. And that centralization must, to stay, to stay solvent, must move to coercion and control. So the world that you're looking through when you say, is it things going to get worse, is yes, because those things have to, have to trick people more through coercion and control. And eventually that world looks like it does in China with a digital ID system that everybody's on one system. It's the only way. There is no other way than move to a free, free market. And, the, and, and, free mar the, and so everything you're looking at through is through that lens of coercion and control. And Bitcoin is untouchable, it's decentralized and secure. So yes, it's going to, you're going to hear a lot of noise, but ask yourself this, even from the Greenpeace side and everything else, um, could you solve, if you believed in climate change, could you solve climate change from a system that has to grow forever by manipulating money? And it's so logical, the abundance of money creates scarcity everywhere. Scarcity and money creates abundance everywhere. It's really that simple. And I would add, stop reading mainstream media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't sell your bitcoins to BlackRock. <laughs> yeah, and don't do that either. No matter the price, you're, you're don't front, sell your you're bitcoins. Front running them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just keep front running them, exactly. <laughs> well, gents, we've got 45 seconds left, so I won't take any more questions. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to uh, close this one down. Um, but I do want to uh, just, just summarize what's going on here. I, I think... Uh, the, the project has been um, an amazing success so far, but there's still so much more work to do. If anybody is interested, you can visit the website, you can get to Madeira, you can uh, reach out to Andre, he's the man on the ground, Andre Loha Loja on Loja. Twitter, <laughs> or go and grab him in the, uh, in the hallway here. <laughs> and uh, a big thank you to uh, the guys that joined us from Edinburgh today. Thank you guys for, uh, for being here and um, taking the questions. Big round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye.